there he is in the midst of them. I will sing to the Lord great love forever, and with my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Would you stand with us please as we sing, He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone out this morning to Community Fellowship Baptist Church. Uh, we're glad to, that you're able to be here this morning or, or watching online. Um, we, we hope that, uh, that uh, the service that we bring to you this morning is, is from the Lord and, and the worship that we sing goes all to Him. Um, I'd like to uh, read a few verses this morning before we start. In 1 Peter chapter 4, starting at verse 7, it says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober mind, and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers all over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, and faithful as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Um, this, this morning, I'd just like to, uh, to acknowledge that there's uh, quite a few ways this, this, because of, of illness, just we should be praying for them. Um, also, there's a, a few way on vacation and traveling, and we just pray that uh, the Lord might be with them as they, as they travel about. Um, there's not very many other announcements this week. Our, our men's <clears throat> prayer breakfast and Bible study has been uh, uh, not canceled, but postponed until after Labor Day again. So anybody that uh, uh, regularly attends that, uh, it, it won't be starting again until, I think it's September 8th or something like that. So, <clears throat> um, And then hopefully in September, we'll be starting up our our other uh, ministries, and uh, we just pray that uh, the Lord might bless us as we plan towards those. Uh, before we begin this morning and, be, and do some more uh, worship singing, we, could we just bow in a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning and praise you, Lord, for, for who you are 
and, and the love that you show each one of us, Lord. We just thank you for, for being here with us this morning and pray that you'd guide and direct as, as, as things progress this morning. Be with Wes as he ministers to us this morning and to those who are, are listening. We also pray for Sandy Cairns as he's ministering ab abroad at, in Lake St. Peter this morning. Just be with him as well and those who, who hear, hear your words that come from his mouth. Guide and direct us this morning. We thank you and praise you. We pray for those who are ill. Uh, just pray that you watch over them, help them be restored to strength. And with those who, who might be out on vacation traveling around, just guide and direct them and, and, and be with them as and in safety. We thank you, Lord, for, for being with us, and, and we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. This next song says, All who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the fountain and dip your heart in the stream of life. And when we are there in the streams of life, we can let the pain that we experience and our sorrow be washed away in the wave of what he has given us, his great mercy. Let's sing this together, please. All who are thirsty. come into your presence this morning and Lord sometimes we don't want to admit how thirsty we are and how much we need you sometimes Lord it's just hard to admit our weakness and Father we just know that you want us to come who we are without any masks on our faces to be somebody else that you just accept us for who we are your word says that you came to earth to heal the sick and lord we are crying out to you this morning that you would be our stream of life lord and that we can take the burden of our hearts and the pain that we're experiencing the burdens, the worry, the anxiety, the loss, the anger, 
and we can dip all of those emotions into the stream of life where, Lord, you will cover us with your love and your mercy. And from there, Lord, we will experience your peace. Father, we just praise your name for who you are and what you do for us. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we commit this service to you, that you would be the one that speaks through Wes and and that the words of the songs this morning would penetrate deep into our hearts and that we would be transformed this morning into being who you want us to be. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Song, take the opportunity to go to the Lord in prayer, personal prayer, and lay those burdens down upon Him as He cares for them. that he is our Lord. What does that mean? Thank you. 
stand with us as we sing the last worship song this morning. Fill my cup, Lord. May this be your, your prayer. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Uh, these are uh, God's words for us this morning. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. And his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths will grow tired and weary and young people will stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This morning, as we were uh, sharing together in, in song, uh, many of those songs were a, a reminder that God invites us into his presence in the midst of our busyness, in the midst of our distraction, in, in the midst of the, the, the joys and the challenges of life to, to enter into his presence, and to look to him as the one who is the true source of, of strength and hope 
And so let's just take a, a moment this morning and come before God. And I, I'm going to invite uh, maybe a, a handful of us to, to lead out in prayer if you feel led to. And after a few moments, I'll close this off. But, but thank God for his presence. Thank God for the gift of salvation through Jesus. Thank you that we can lay our burdens down uh, before him as the community of his people this morning. And so let's just take a moment and acknowledge uh, the presence and goodness of our God and King. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord, your word says, be still and know that I am God. And so right now in this time, as we just quiet our, our, our hearts and, and bow our heads in your presence, we acknowledge that uh, you are our hope. You are the one that gives us peace and joy. Your presence is enough for us. Lord God, we are grateful that uh, you have made peace possible because of Jesus. That Jesus coming from heaven into this world, his life and sacrificial death on the cross has, has purchased peace and forgiveness and joy and, and has restored a broken relationship that was broken and marred by sin. And so God, we are grateful this morning for forgiveness. And we are grateful for the invitation of Jesus to come to him, to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And so, God, we embrace the presence of Jesus, and we embrace uh, the rest of God in this place and in our hearts and lives this morning. We honor you, Lord God, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we've had uh, a number of uh, exciting things happening uh, this summer as people have been coming and going. And uh, as we kind of move towards the, the middle of August and uh, start to prepare for back to school, I, I know some of us don't really want to talk about that yet. You guys don't want to talk about that yet, do you? No, I didn't think so. But uh, we've had a, a number of things happening with some of our young people, and so just wanted to uh, give a, a bit of an update. Uh, last week, uh, Joy Camp, a number of their staff were here, and a number of our uh, families and uh, individuals have been serving out at Joy, uh, the Watts family, uh, Craig and Kathy, and uh, Seth and Levi, Craig and, and Levi, um, just for the majority of the summer, and then uh, Ben and Kelsey as well, and uh, Ben has been working out there. But this week, uh, we had uh, Seth and Stephen both uh, uh, take a bit of a step of faith as there was a need with some junior cabin leaders at Joy, and both of them stepped into uh, that position, and both of them found it difficult and overwhelming, and yet we rejoice that, that they were willing to take a step of faith and to be used by God uh, out of their comfort zones in that way. And God had some great things to teach in them and do in them through that experience, but wanted to just uh, let you know, because uh, as a church family, we've been praying for um, those opportunities and for them, and so we're just rejoicing uh, that God gave them that opportunity and allowed the week to go 
uh, really well. And then uh, this morning, too, I'm going to invite uh, Julie to come for a second because, uh, Julie, uh, this is your last Sunday here for a little while. And uh, I'm hoping that we're going to see you again at Christmas time, but I haven't, whoops, as I'm kicking fake plants over and things like that. But uh, I, you're planning to come home for, uh, for Christmas break? But tell us kind of, you're leaving tomorrow, and mom and dad are going with you on the first part of this adventure. So give us a little bit of an update and uh, tell us how we can pray for you as a, as a church family. Hello, every. I think so. Hello? Can you guys hear me? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so tomorrow, as Wes was saying, I leave, um, and I am driving out to Alberta for school. Um, so I'm going to Prairie College, uh, which is a Bible college out there, and I'm going to take the paramedic program. Um, so it is a full year course. I start in September, and then um, including my placement and everything, I'll be finishing the beginning of September next year. Um, so um, I could, uh, so we're driving out there. We're going to take our time to get out there. I have my vehicle, and I am taking my horse. Uh, so I am hauling a horse across Canada. So I could really use your prayers um, as I do that. Um, and then my parents are coming with me, and they're taking their camper trailer so we can stay overnight in that. Um, so just prayer that, you know, things go smoothly. I don't blow a tire. Um, and then once I get out there, it's going to be a huge adjustment. Um, I've never been to Alberta before, and I'm just kind of moving out for the first time. So um, just kind of regular prayers, um, prayers that I would do well in my studies and um, I could learn lots about God and glorify him through my school and through my work. Well, hey, Julie, thank you so much. And uh, we'll uh, continue to share some updates as uh, you make that journey and uh, also as you uh, kind of let us know how school's going and stuff. But let's uh, pray together for Julie this morning and just ask God to uh, be with her and Rod and Cynthia on this uh, adventure. I'm, I'm pretty excited to hear uh, about what God does for you on, on this trip, but not only on that, but, but as you go to a Christian school to, to continue your education and, and gain new knowledge and skills to see how God is going to use um, those things in your life as you serve him. So let's uh, pray together. God, thank you for today. Thank you for Julie. Thank you for uh, uh, what she means and is to our church family, for those of us who have had the privilege of knowing her for many years and watching her uh, grow and change and learn and, and go off on mission trips and uh, uh, DTS and YWAM and just the, the all of the, the changes and transformations that, God, you have already done in her life. We commit her into your hands, and especially uh, this journey out to Alberta. We pray for safety. We pray for peace and wisdom for her and Rod and Cynthia. Uh, we pray that uh, your hand of, of kindness and protection and provision would be on them. And then as she settles in in Three Hills at Prairie, that uh, you would just allow her to adjust to a new place, a new culture, that she would meet many new friends. And God, that she would really deepen in her love for you, in her love for people, and her desire to use the abilities that you've given her, to her for your kingdom and for your glory. And so God, we give her to you now and just, uh, just pray many, many blessings on her. And uh, Lord, we're going to miss her, but we're uh, knowing that uh, uh, you are the one who has led and will continue to lead uh, on this, uh, in this process and on this journey. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Julie. And I guess uh, at this point, we are going to uh, ask the kids to uh, head downstairs. And uh, I think uh, Rod is going downstairs with uh, them this morning. And so kind of grade uh, seven and down, you can head downstairs uh, to, uh, to your class. And uh, as you guys go, uh, we're going to pray for you. And uh, we're also going to praise God for our offering. If uh, you wanted to partner with us in offering, there is a, uh, an offering box on the way in uh, near the back door here. And you can also uh, partner with us through e-transfer. I think there's uh, some information that we have for that, but offering at cfbcbancroft.ca. And then we're going to look at God's Word together. So let's pray for that too as we, uh, um, as we continue this morning. 
God, you are the one who provides for all of our needs. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would just continue to use uh, the gifts that you give to us, that we return to you for your glory and for your kingdom purposes. God, thank you for your ongoing faithfulness in that way. Lord, we pray for our kids as they go downstairs, that you would bless them and guide them. And Lord, we pray to this morning that uh, your word would go forth in power and that your spirit would, would be um, with us, speaking to us, challenging us, and changing us through your word. And I, I pray all of these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as uh, we look into God's Word this morning, I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Acts, and we've been in the middle of a, a series there. Uh, but as the, we were thinking about uh, Joy Camp this last week and some of the activities, some of you will know that I have uh, the opportunity most summers to either uh, speak at Joy and, and Graphite and to be involved there. So for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be doing the Teen Day Camp up at Graphite, and I get to do a, a chapel every morning and open God's Word and answer uh, questions that our young people are asking. And man, I would so appreciate your prayers uh, for wisdom and for sensitivity and for boldness, for, for hearts that are open to, to hear God's Word together, and uh, just looking forward to that opportunity. But there are some things that I absolutely love about camp. And when I was younger, uh, 16 and 17, I, I spent uh, a number of summers at camp as a counselor and program staff. And one of my favorite activities was counselor hunt. Did you ever go to camp and do that? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's, it's ultimately hide and seek. Really, that's what it is. The counselors hide and the campers have to seek them and find them. And sometimes there's cabin points as a reward. And other times there's a, uh, you know, a, a whipped cream pie in the face if the counselor gets caught. And all of the fun things about camp. But there are moments at camp where we engage in a, a game of, of hide and seek. And yet sometimes we do that as well. Now, maybe, maybe you've done that recently. You've seen someone somewhere. You're like, I don't really want to talk to them today. And, and you kind of put your head down and, and head in a different direction. Some of you are laughing nervously right now. But what about spiritually? I wonder if we ever play a game of hide and seek spiritually. You see, the Bible tells us that there is a God who has created this world and created each one of us. And that because of uh, the, the entrance of sin into this world and in our lives, there is a break in that relationship that we've been created for. And apart from God, we find ourselves hiding, running away, trying to take care of things on our own. And yet, this morning, as we come to Acts chapter 9 in our series, Acts of God, we're going to see that God is at work in spite of appearances, in spite of where a group of people or an individual might be at, that God is someone who longs to and is able to and is at work pursuing us. I think I've shared uh, this poem before. I, I know I have. It's, it's a favorite of mine, though. It was written by Francis Thompson in the late 1800s, around 1890. And his poem is called The Hound of Heaven. Listen to this poem. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. And under running laughter, up visted hopes I sped and shot, precipitated adown titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. But with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, 
deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat. And a voice beat, more instant than the feet. All things betray thee who betrayest me. Sometimes in our walk and relationship with God, we are people who instead of being close to him and running to the one who has created us, find ourselves on a path or on a journey where we are actually fleeing as fast as we can and as hard as we can away from God. And this morning, we want to uh, look together at the life of someone who, who has done just that. And we want to think about this question. What can change someone who is far from God? How can they come to him? How can someone's life that is lived in a way that seems so opposite from the, the values of God and, and seems to be uh, on a... How can you be changed? How can I be changed? How can someone who we would love to understand the power and work of God, how can their life be transformed? In, in this series, we've said that, that the book of Acts is about transformation. The transformation of, of people, the beginning of the church, and ultimately the transformation by God of our entire world through the good news about Jesus. And so this morning, let's look together at how the good news of Jesus, Acts chapter 9, we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 19 this morning. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. The, the person that we're going to investigate this morning is Saul. And you can tell by the language in verse 1 here, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats that there's a backstory. And if you've been here with us, uh, you'll maybe remember some of that backstory about Saul. We didn't look at him last week. We talked about Philip. But in chapter 7, we hear about the first Christian martyr, the first person who was murdered simply because of their faith and belief in Jesus. And we're told that at the martyrdom of Stephen and the stoning of him, uh, we are told that there is a young man there. We find in uh, Acts 7, I'm going to read verse uh, um, 59 uh, about Stephen. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And we are told in chapter 8, verse 1, that Saul approved of their killing him. In fact, Saul had been introduced to us just in the paragraph before that when they were yelling uh, about Stephen and they had dragged him outside the city to stone him, we're told that the witnesses had laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And then very quickly after the death of Stephen, we are told that Saul approved of their killing him. That's the first introduction that we have to Saul in the New Testament in the book of Acts. And there's a result in chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And the implication by Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, is that Saul was there, and he was approving of the death of Stephen, and that something began in that moment inside of Saul, and it wasn't a good and blessed thing. It was a terrible thing. He decided that he would persecute God's people. That, that what had happened with Stephen and his killing was ultimately a good thing. The name of Jesus needed to be destroyed, and all who celebrated and worshipped and, and took the name of Jesus 
needed to be dealt with. And so if we fast forward through uh, chapter 8, we find in verse 9 that time has passed, but something hasn't changed, and that is Saul. He is still angry, and he is still upset, and he wants to put more people to death just like Stephen. And so he goes so far as to take action in the midst of this. He asks the high priest, the religious leader of the time, for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that he could deal with those who were followers of Jesus in that place. And he said, whether they are men or whether they are women, he would take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Here we have a picture of a man who is, is very religious. Saul, we are, find out later on in the New Testament, was uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was very zealous for the law of God, and he felt that the only way that someone uh, could properly honor God was to, to forget about Jesus and to focus only on the Old Testament. God could only be found through Judaism, and it was up to Saul to make sure that that happened. Saul is on this journey, far from God, and he is convinced about the correctness of his judgment and his actions. I wonder if you know anyone like Saul. In fact, some of you here today can relate to Saul because you've been there. You've been people who were, uh, wanted nothing to do with Jesus. He said, I am not the church-going type. I, I am not someone who wants to dedicate my life to, to following Jesus in any way, shape, or form. And maybe you didn't go to the lengths that Saul did, taking action to travel the world and, and to put Christians in prison and bring them back and make sure that they faced um, trial or, or consequences for their worship. But maybe in, in so many ways, you had said, I want nothing to do with Jesus. And if that's not you, maybe it never has been you. Maybe you've always been interested in Jesus or open to him, but I can guarantee that you know someone. Maybe even this week, you've had a conversation with someone who said, you know, you just, you just get so excited about this Jesus stuff. You're just a little bit too religious for me. I, I can't understand. I, I don't want to go there. I like my freedom, and I like my fun, and I'm quite content with where I'm at. That's where Saul was. He's far from God, and he's convinced in his own mind uh, about the things that, that he is doing and saying. Later on uh, in the book of Acts, we'll find out exactly what, uh, what Saul, uh, how Saul uh, saw his actions in the midst of that. In Acts chapter 26, verse 9, this is uh, what we read there. Paul writing or speaking himself. I too was convinced, Saul uh, writing or speaking himself, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison, and, then, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. That's how Saul would characterize his life and experience. He wanted nothing to do with Jesus. In fact, he wanted to do everything possible to destroy Jesus. That's not just true of Saul back in uh, the days of the early church and the book of Acts. But there are many people today, many people that we hear about, uh, many that we read on Facebook or we watch on YouTube uh, as, as we talk to people, we hear this sentiment that, that we are 
foolish for following Jesus? Why would we give our lives in service of, of uh, a man who lived and died 2,000 years ago? Why would we do that? And yet, we believe as Christians, and many of us have experienced that God, in spite of where we're at, is able to change hearts and lives. And, and so this morning, I want us to see that uh, life can be changed. And, and, and there is a, a, a pattern that we see in Scripture that changes someone's life. A life is changed when, and here, as we contemplate in the first couple of verses of this chapter, a life is changed when someone who is far from God. That's Saul. That's many people that we know. I, I love reading, the uh, sharing the testimony of people, whether that's people in our, our church as they come to faith in Christ, or whether that's a, a testimony that's shared in a, in a video online or in a conversation with someone that I meet in a, a book that I read. One of the uh, most interesting books that I have read in the last number of years is uh, by uh, a lady named Rosaria Butterfeld. And she wrote a book uh, called The Secret Confessions of an Unlikely Convert. The Secret Confessions of an Unlikely Convert. It was the story, ultimately, of her journey to faith. She was a, an atheist, or at least an agnostic. She was a, a feminist studies professor living in a same-sex relationship. And she seemed to be someone, by her own admission, who wanted nothing to do with Jesus. And yet it was through the friendship of a couple of Christians, the, their hospitality inviting her into their home, and beginning to look into God's Word, have conversations respectfully uh, about God and the Bible and life and, and purpose and meaning and joy and hope and all of these things that, that someone who was far from God found herself in a place that seemed uncomfortable beginning to question whether God was there, whether God might actually care about someone like her. You know, C.S. Lewis had a very uh, similar journey. You may know of his writings through the, the children's books, The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. But C.S. Lewis wrote about his own journey to faith, which took place uh, as an adult, where he began uh, his life as an atheist, eventually moved to a theist, somebody who said, I, I think there is some kind of God or force, but I, I don't know who he is. And eventually he came to understand through these experiences of God giving him uh, illumination and, and really ultimately moments of joy that kept leading him down this path that there was someone named Jesus, someone who could ultimately change his life. And he became a, a follower of Jesus Christ. He, he recounts that in the book, Surprised by Joy. There's a, a recent movie, actually, in, in uh, uh, 2021 that just came out. And uh, he, it's, it's called uh, The Most Unlikely Convert. It's based on the book, Surprised by Joy. But in that book... Surprised by joy, C.S. Lewis said this, Joy is like a signpost to those lost in the woods, pointing the way, and that its appearance is not as important when we have found the road and are passing signposts every few miles. God used joy and meaning and purpose and that search for, for what could bring fulfillment and hope in the midst of his life to point him on this journey to Jesus. We've said that a, a life is changed when someone who is far from God is captured by Christ. This man, Saul, who had it out for the church and for Christians, experiences something that he was not expecting. Verse 3, 
As Saul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. And Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Do you see what's taking place in Saul's life? That uh, on this journey with a letter in hand to arrest Christians and to bring them back to Jerusalem so that they could face trial, so they could be imprisoned, so that eventually they could be put to death, so that they would stop following Jesus. On this journey to Damascus, he has an experience and an encounter and ultimately he is captured by the one that he thought he was persecuting and pursuing. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now it's interesting, you could say that Saul persecuted Stephen, couldn't you? He persecuted Stephen because he was a follower of Jesus. That each of the people that he arrested who had a name and a, a, a location and a, a family that they were part of, that Saul was the one who was persecuting these people. And yet from, a, from an eternal perspective, from a spiritual perspective, that those things that, that are done to us in the name of Jesus or because of Jesus are done not just to you or me, but they are ultimately done to Jesus himself. And so that's why when Jesus shows up in Saul's life and he reveals himself to him in this incredible vision where his companions don't see Jesus, but they hear his voice. Why are you persecuting me, Saul? And Saul is forced to ask a question. And frankly, it's a question that he may already know the answer to, but he needs to hear it for himself. Who are you, Lord? Obviously, this one who is speaking to him and is revealing himself in this vision, this one who is encountering Saul on the Damascus road, it has great power. That's why his journey has been interrupted. This one who has encountered Saul on the Damascus road is, is not just powerful, but, but he is um, obviously in control of, of many different things that, that he can get Saul's attention in spite of what's happening around and in spite of Paul's, Saul's plan. And so when he asks that question, who are you, Lord? And he receives this answer, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I am Jesus. Can you imagine how Saul felt in that moment? Spiritually, he was coming to an understanding that the one that he had been trying to stop and destroy, the one who, who his name he was trying to erase from all of history, the one whose, whose name people were, were, were believing and worshiping and, and praying, and he was trying to, to correct their spiritual misunderstanding. And in that moment, Saul, hearing the name of Jesus, is forced to confront the fact that, that he was wrong in his conviction. He was wrong in his experience, and he was wrong in his actions. That instead of, of uh, persecuting the people of Jesus, he should have been embracing Jesus as the one who was the Son of God come down. You see, Saul was a, a Pharisee, a religious leader and teacher, and he would have known the, the expectation from the Old Testament that God was going to come to his people that God was going to send someone who was absolutely necessary and absolutely needed. He was going to send a Messiah, a Savior, 
that the Christ would come from God to redeem and restore and renew and transform. And this one who had been hoping for the coming of a Messiah had rejected the claims of Jesus to be that Messiah. And now here on the Damascus Road, on a journey to bring Christians and to put them in prison, to cause them to suffer and eventually to have them killed, he's confronted with the fact that this Jesus, who he thought was dead, truly was and is alive. And Saul was standing before him in his presence. Saul didn't have any choice, did he? He didn't get to make a decision or to raise his hand. His decision had already been made. He wanted nothing to do with Jesus. And yet the grace and pursuit and love of God is such that Jesus wanted everything to do with Saul. He wanted Saul's heart and life. He wanted to forgive him and redeem and restore him. And that's the work that God alone can do. You know, the, the evidence or the, 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 the testimony of, of all of Scripture is how God is pursuing His people. His people who many times are, are far, far away from Him. And they want nothing to do with Him. In Isaiah chapter 65, God uh, tells his people that they are on a, a, a course far away from him. Isaiah 65, verse 1, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I. Here am I. And all day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations, a people who continually provoke me to my very face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil, who eat the flesh of pigs and whose pots hold broth of impure meat, who say, keep away, don't come near me, for I am too scared for you. Such people are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that keeps burning all day. Isn't it amazing that, that God is the one who is inviting us as his people to return to him and to look to him? And just like so many people in the Bible, just like Saul, and just like each one of us, we have all together turned aside. I, uh, later in the, the book of Psalms, and, and it'll be quoted by Saul when he writes the book of Romans after his conversion to Christianity, he says, there is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. Because of sin, because of rebellion, because of our own pride and selfishness, we have turned from the God who stands inviting us to himself. And we have said, God, I've got this. I'm going to do it on my own, and I'm going to do it without you or your son, Jesus. And yet God continues to call us. Into the New Testament, we see that God calls us by sending his son into the world. John chapter 1 talks about the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. God came down to live among us. His light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. God is pursuing His people. I love the, the parables in Luke 15. Jesus told three stories in Luke chapter 15. Three stories about God pursuing us. Do you remember them? The first one is about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, and one of them wandered off, as sheep are, are wont to do. And the shepherd left the 99 sheep 
And he went after one sheep. And, and when he found that sheep, he brought it back and just returned rejoicing and celebrating. And then the, the story is of a, a woman who had several coins and she lost one of them and she swept her house over and over and she found the coin and, and she celebrated and rejoiced because the, the lost coin had been found. And then there was the story of a, 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 of a son who in spite of his father's love and goodness took his inheritance and went off and spent the entire thing in wild living and a famine came and and he said I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask my father to take me back as a servant and not a son and so he he goes back home and the father has been watching and waiting for him and he runs out and welcomes that lost son home and brings him into the house and puts a, a cloak on him and shoes on his feet and a ring, the, the symbol of the, the family's honor and authority on his finger. And he says, let's slaughter the fattened calf and have a party and celebrate because my son was lost and is found. He is dead he was dead, and now he's alive again. That is the nature and the character of our God. Even when we are not seeking him, he is the one who is not far from us, though we may be far from him. And he is the one who, through his son Jesus, is at work in our lives so we might be captured by Christ. Jesus says in John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. God is the one who is at work pursuing us to capture us. And in the midst of that, Saul is, is humbled on this journey to Damascus. He says in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, I know that good itself does not dwell in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I'm far from God. And yet Jesus met Saul and captured him. I read the poem by Francis Thompson uh, earlier as we, as we started, the, the Hound of Heaven. And yet Francis Thompson's life was not one of, of constantly seeking God. In fact, he could write very vividly those words about God's pursuit of him because that's exactly what God had to do. Francis Thompson, uh, we read his early life, was one dead end after another. He studied for the priesthood, but did not complete the course. He studied medicine, but failed. He joined the military, but was released after one day. What do you have to do one day to get kicked out of the military? He finally became an opium addict in London, England, but he could not get away from God's persistent love for him. In the midst of his despondency, Thompson was befriended by an associate who saw his poetic gifts, and eventually Thompson was able to share his life experience in verse. I wonder for you if you've had a Damascus Road experience, a moment in your life where the presence of Jesus shows up in such a powerful and undeniable way that you recognize that though you may have lived a life far from God, that Jesus in his grace and mercy has been calling you, the Father has been pursuing you, and there comes a point where there is no longer any doubt, but you fall on your knees before him with that question, who are you, Lord? And you understand like Saul, I am Jesus. Jesus has revealed himself to you. C.S. Lewis described his conversion in this way. I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. God is the initiator. Jesus is the one who captures us for himself. So a life is changed when someone who is far from God is captured by Christ. But that's not the end of the journey, is it? It's certainly not for Saul. And, and we see that here because someone who is captured by Christ 
begins to learn that they can trust God's plan. And that's what happens in verses 10 to 19. Verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias feel at this instruction from God. Uh, God, you want me to do something? Hey, that sounds great. You want me to go somewhere and meet someone? That's no problem, God. I've met Jesus and my life's been changed and I'm happy to do what you want me to do. Maybe until Ananias hears the name of the individual who he's going to help. A man from Tarsus? Okay. A man named Saul. Saul's reputation had more than preceded him. The believers lived in fear of who Saul was and what he represented. Not enough to run away. They trusted Jesus, but they didn't want anything to do with Saul. And now here was God speaking to Ananias and go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and find this man named Saul from Tarsus, for he is praying. And so Ananias answers in verse 13, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Do you know what Ananias is saying? Ananias is saying to God, God, this is not a good idea. You, you, you know who he is. You know where he's come from. You know the harm that he has caused your holy, your set apart, your chosen people, your followers. He has, he has hurt us. He has killed us. He has put us in prison simply because of Jesus. And now you want me to go and to, to, to help this man? And God speaks to Ananias in verse 15 and says, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. It's not often that people are given um, insight by God into the story or journey of someone else. Often what God does is reveals his, his will or purpose in, in our lives, and he calls us to walk in, in obedience to him. But, but here, Ananias is given some insight into what the rest of Saul's life is going to look like as a follower of God. He is going to be used to proclaim the good news about Jesus to people who should embrace it, the Jews, and to people who have no idea who Jesus is or, or what he's talking about, the Gentiles. But in that process, whether it's the Jews or the Gentiles, he will sh God will show Saul how much he must suffer for his name. And so that's what Ananias does. He goes to the house and he enters it. He places his hands on Saul and he says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again, and he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Ananias walks in, places his hands on Saul, prays for him, and Saul's eyes are opened. Scales fall to the ground, and he can see. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost, am ne was, am, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. That was, that was Saul's experience in this house when God's servant Ananias shows up and prays for him. Wow, what a powerful prayer. What a, what, a, what a great calling to pray for each other in the midst of difficulties and suspicions. And Ananias could have said, I'll, I'll go, but God, I don't want to touch him. God, I'll go, but I, I don't necessarily want to get too close to him. 
God, I'll, I'll listen and I'll obey at some point, but, 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 but to place my hands on him and to pray over him? And yet God doesn't give his servants any choice but obedience, does he? And so Ananias, on his own journey of faith with God, was taught that, that he needed to trust God's plan and that he would be part of God's plan in Saul's life to allow him to see again. And so he does just that. God has sent me to you. He prays for him, and, and Saul can see again. And Saul immediately understands something about the life of a relationship lived with Jesus and with Jesus' people, that we have to be willing to trust God's plan even when it seems dangerous even when it might not fully make sense to us. And so we're allowed to ask questions just like Ananias did. <laughs> we're even allowed to, to offer our objection to God. But you may remember the story of the, the prophet Jonah. Jonah. Right, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. And Jonah goes in the exact opposite direction. He says, God, I'm not going to listen. In the end, God wins, doesn't he? he Jonah gets thrown overboard. A, a, a fish swallows him. He goes to the city and he, he preaches. And, and, and the people turn in repentance. And even then, Jonah's not happy. But, but the story of Scripture over and over is that God calls us as his people, as followers of Jesus, to a life and relationship of trust and obedience, even when it's difficult and even when we don't fully understand or make sense. What, what do you do? How do you respond when it seems like God's plan or God's leading is questionable? Well, sometimes we throw up our hands in despair, don't we? God, I, I thought you said that you were with me. God, I thought you reassured me of your presence and your goodness, and this doesn't feel very good, and you don't feel very near. And yet, what we see in the Word of God over and over is that God's promises are true. That Jesus invites us to come to Him when we're weary, when we are weak, to take His yoke upon us, to learn from him because he is gentle and humble in heart. And it's in relationship with him that Saul, that you and me this morning can find rest for our souls. This morning we have seen that a life is changed when someone who is far from God is captured by Christ. And then we have the privilege of beginning to learn to trust God's plan. As we think about what this means to, to take it home, uh, a few questions for us is, is God pursuing me this morning? Maybe you're not someone who, is, who has ever um, given your life to Jesus. Maybe like Saul, you have, have lived in opposition of Jesus and somebody has dragged you here this morning kicking and screaming and, and, and you're saying, I, I don't want to go. And maybe this morning, like Saul, God is getting your attention, calling you to bow your knee before him and to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then maybe if you've taken that step of faith and, and prayed that prayer of repentance, asking Jesus to forgive your sins, maybe you can see God's gracious pursuit in your life. And if you can, give thanks to him. Thank God for his mercy in calling you to himself. Re rejoice, remember, celebrate it. And then, and then finally, a, a question that, that I think is so key for us, who am I praying for God to pursue and save? Who in, in my life, in my circle of, of friends, uh, who is a family member or a coworker, or a neighbor, uh, someone that I, that I desperately long to see come to know Jesus, and yet they seem like Saul so far away. Can I tell you that God isn't concerned how near or far somebody appears? God is able to draw all people to himself. That's what Jesus said. When I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. That as we look to Jesus, 
He can change whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, however we've lived our lives up until that point. Saul's life was changed when he was captured by Christ on a Damascus road. And we can pray for people who are the most unlikely converts that we know that God would work, that Jesus would save, and they would enter into a life and relationship of learning to trust him and obey him always. So who can you pray for? Who are you praying for God to pursue and save? I'm glad that God pursues people like Saul. Because do you know what it means? That God pursues people like you and me as well. That Jesus' power to save is great. Greater than we could ever imagine. And it's only through him that our chains can be gone that we can be set free, that we may be lost, but by God's grace, we can be found. We may be blind, but God allows us to see. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you that your love, your goodness is enough, that your love is not put off by the response of people to you, that Jesus You came into this world in agreement with the Father and the Spirit to to give your life as a ransom for all who would put their faith in you. And that you are calling us, whether we are near or far off, you are the one who is at work offering forgiveness and, and joy and peace and hope. And God, we rejoice that you've done this for those that have have turned to you. But Lord, there are people on our hearts that, that, it, that it actually breaks our hearts right now that they don't know you, how far from you they seem. So God, would you work in their lives? Would you draw them to yourself? Lord, would you allow us over the next number of weeks to see people who are, who are not just tough nuts to crack, but, but, but most unlikely converts that we can think of. May we see them transformed and changed because of the pursuit of Jesus and the salvation that comes through no other name. We would praise you. We would adore you. We would honor you because of that. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
to play, I'm just going to ask you to have a moment of silent prayer before the Lord. Just bow your heads where you are and ask the Lord, what has he said to you this morning? Is he calling on your heart to turn to him? Is he calling you to a life of pure joy and a life of peace? Just take this moment and, and ask him, what is he asking of you? does God call us to himself, but he calls us to walk each day, each moment with him. And so that's why uh, Paul, Saul, whose uh, Greek name is Paul, who wrote the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians and much of the New Testament, wrote these words in 1 Thessalonians 5. And we close with this blessing. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Today, God is calling. Will we turn to him in obedience and faith, and will we long for the day of his return? God, we thank you that we can trust in you and hope in you. Would you, Lord, give us the ability and the strength and the courage and the humility to respond to your call. And may we live this week looking to you, knowing you, and serving you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.